<laughs> Why well, I always gotta be the one to remember your job? Were we live when I was cursing Tom Heineber? Yes. I mean, a little bit. I mean, a little bit. I'm like, Tom Heineber, did you turn off the AC? No. Drop a couple F-bombs. Throw a diva fit. It's what I do, people. This is against medical advice. And uh, it's usually medical advice not to curse on a live show. That's true. And I just did it. What's up, z -Pack? It is Dr. Zubin Nemanja. We have a studio audience with us that you can't see. Yay! <laughs> and one of them is a doc. One of them is an audio producer. One of them is just awesome. And so they might be shouting comments at us. But what, what I wanted to talk about today, look, all week we've been talking, at least the last few days, about Nurse Alex Wubbles and the horrible footage of her being arrested forcibly in her place of work uh, in the emergency department in Utah and all the drama and fallout that came of that. Now we have talked about this quite a bit and we'll talk about it more probably in the future. But the point being, here is a group of frontline healthcare practitioners, the nurses, who have been long suffering, who still have the, some of the highest trust scores from the public, and you see them being abused on the front lines. But there, is, there are others across the healthcare spectrum, and here on the show, one of our missions is to promote teamwork across the continuum of care. Every type of health caregiver uh, ought to be working in teams, practicing at the top of their license. Now, there is a group of our brothers and sisters who suffer indignity on a daily basis, misunderstanding on a daily basis, and they are essential to Health 3.0 actually functioning. And this all came to a head, but it got 1 79th thousandth the play that the nurse uh, piece got. And I'd like to play the offending clip, if you don't mind, Logan. It's time to... Uh Address a video that I put up on our Thinker Girls Facebook page yesterday. There's a 15 minute wait, I'm getting a script. What is the hold up on the process? Like you hand over your prescription and they're like, sure, there'll be a 15 minute wait. Here's your little buzzer and uh, we'll be with you in 15. But is there some kind of magical process that's taking place back there? Because I'm very intrigued. Is anyone a pharmacist and actually can shed some light on this? Oh. Oh yes, there are some pharmacists who can shed some light on this. So this Australian um, personality, I don't know her name. Uh, She's some one part of the Thinker Girls, apparently, Ooh. which is some kind of Australian thing with a bad name. It, yeah, it's like, uh, <laughs> and I love Australia. We have a lot of fans from Australia. So I'm just going to say that <laughs> if you have to call yourself the Thinker Girls, you're probably trying too hard to look like you think. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what ended up happening here is this thing, her original video, which has since been pulled from the interwebs uh, through some like, by the way, when you flush a video in Australia, the, the, the virtual water spins the opposite direction than the northern hemisphere. This is a scientific fact. It was deleted because it created so much outrage. She's like, is there a pharmacist up here who can, uh, who can shed some light on this? Because I've waited like 15 minutes and how hard is it to put some pills in a bag? Put a little label on it and give it to me. Carrie That's ben not a knife. This is a knife. <laughs> Carrie Bennett says, oh, 15 minutes. That's all. I, that, that was my first thought. <laughs> I'm like, the pharma that's the fastest pharmacy in the West, yo. Because when I go to Walgreens CVS, I'm like, ding, 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 ding. And then I wait some more. And then they call the doc. And then it turns out it's not on formulary. And then it turns out it interacts with the crack cocaine that I'm smoking and other things. So. Why this video was so interesting, and by the way, the thinker girl had to unthink this piece. So she went on and did something that you're not supposed to do on the internet, which is apologize. Mm. So she was like, I had no idea what happened here. I, I, apparently I opened up a, a, a can of, uh, uh, a can of uh, a Vegemite. <laughs> it's it's to total Vegemite. And uh, now everything's falling apart in my life. <laughs> and everyone's unsubscribing. And who knew that pharmacists were a thing? And this is the thing, pharmacists are a thing, because what had, ha what had happened was people realized, wait, these guys and gals behind the counter are actually highly trained, highly educated, four years of post-college training to be a PharmD. You learn the ins and outs of pharmacology, of aspects of clinical medicine. They don't just dispense pills. They do chronic disease management, Coumadin management. They provide certain immunizations, which our pediatrician in the audience will respect, especially flu shots. 
and they are your frontline expert on the medications that you take. And since so much of what we do in Western medicine is medication based, they are our First of all, they're a direct connection with patients. Many people spend more time talking to that pharmacist and having that interaction than they do with a harried doctor or nurse practitioner who's trying to get through 40 patients in a day and click the boxes so that they cannot get fired. So in the world of Health 2.0, they may be the last human you talk to before you take that medication that maybe was prescribed erroneously, maybe uh, isn't covered by your insurance, gonna cost you $2,000, and you don't know until you interface with the pharmacist. Why does it take so long? Because pharmacists are slow, lazy, and incompetent. Right, Tom? I mean, that's just, that's a stone cold fact, you guys. Like, yeah. we can't, you know, just have, it's not true. It's not true at all. Tell them the real reason, Z. Truth, talk to the people. I'm gonna talk to people Speak right now. Speak truth to power, Z. It's tell power, the people what they wanna hear, it's Z. It's power listening? Tell them the truth, Tell the people the truth, Z. If power is listening, I'm gonna tell you right now, power. Pharmacists, are highly trained, highly educated, top of their license practitioners in the art of health 3.0. Without them, the system falls apart. And they, the reason they take time is number one, they have to make sure you're the right patient, it's the right prescription for the right person that all the dates and stuff match, okay? They have to make sure that it doesn't interact with other medications you're taking in a deadly way that your doctor may have missed or that the EHR didn't flag. If you even are lucky enough to use an EHR, and yes, I said lucky enough, because as much as we hate them, they actually can prevent these sort of errors, right? And they can do things that we as humans using paper can't intuitively do, even though they slow us down and all the other things we talked about. They will, um, spend the time explaining to you how to take the medication and making sure that actually you actually got it for the correct indication and a billion other things. In fact, there was a pharmacist who wrote a response to this thing. Uh, Tom, and I'm looking at some of these uh, comments. Jessica Lee says, thanks for the druggist shout out. Hey, that you damn. go back to Tad. <laughs> what up farm? Or should I say fam? Or fam farm? Or farm fam? Why am I out of focus? I'm out. Um, Druggist is what the the British and Australian term for yeah. pharmacist. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I like it. It sounds kind of like hard. Like the druggist. Yo, what up, fam? I'm a druggist. Yeah. Pop, pop, pop. Another lisinopril drop. Druggist uh, sounds like uh, like what Bill Cosby would do. <laughs> the druggist. The druggist. <laughs> <laughs> well, it look it looks like the the the, the pills are gonna make you unconscious and then unspeakable horrors will be foisted upon you. God, what happened to Bill Cosby? Why? Anyways, uh, this is against medical advice. We don't curse here, but we do have some innuendo. So if your children are watching, just remember, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Um, Get to the letter, Z. Read the letter. Read man. the letter. Read the All letter. right, Tom Heinebur, always keeping me on track, which is absurd because you're the last person to keep anyone on track, but I'm going to take it. So this, okay, so what this pharmacist, first of all, let me, let me tell you what a Z-Packer sent me on the back end because she heard I was going to do a thing on pharmacists. She said, can't hardly wait for tomorrow's pharmacy topic. Finally, pharmacy tech here. Now remember the techs. Okay, just so you know. Four years of school for the pharmacist, then um, uh, they make around on median salary about $122,000 a year. So it's pretty good money, but not good enough for all the BS they have to put up with, in my opinion. However, the pharmacy techs who are helping the pharmacist fill the prescriptions, dispense medical, do all that other stuff, they're on the front lines. They're like, kind of like the CNAs or the MAs of the pharmacy world, if I'm understanding correctly. Their average salary is, drum roll please, $32,000. That is a subsistence wage. So these guys work really hard. They take a lot of crap and they're making this. So the ph pharmacy technician here, tired of hearing it's only a cream. How long can it take to put a label on it? Maybe it's not covered by your insurance. Maybe your doctor didn't put specific directions on it. For example, just writing PRN will not pass an audit from an insurance company. So how many times, Doc, in the back, have we written a uh, butt cream, PRN, the butt? <laughs> 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 Apparently, you know, uh, Blue Cross will come back and be like, yes, what do you mean by butt and PRN and two butt? And they won't cover it. So these kind of things, then, then what has to happen is the pharmacy and the pharmacist have to call the doctor to get a clarification. And the doctor is super busy, or they're at lunch, and then the patient's waiting, the pharmacist's waiting, right? 
So this kind of thing actually leads to a snowball effect that then makes the pharmacy seem like the DMV, except that the DMV, they just don't do anything. At the pharmacy, it just <laughs> takes a long time to do stuff. Am That's I wrong? True. Yeah, I've never left the DMV with hydrocodone, not once. I have. It's shameful. I, I, I actually have. There's a guy, uh, Jerome, out, out front. Have you talked to Jerome yet? Leanne, yeah, Parks. <laughs> Leanne says, I've had the pharmacist call me when I mess up RXs, and thank God they cover my ass, right? Who said that? Uh, Leanne. And it, then Erica said, behind every great doctor is a great pharmacist. Absolutely. So I agree. Literally behind, because I make them walk four steps behind me. Because I'm the boss, damn it. This is a hierarchy. No, and this is the thing. In the hierarchy of medicine, pharmacists have often been uh, uh, under underappreciated, underrepresented. And let, 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 let's dig into this a bit. So when I get a call from a pharmacist, and I was talking to the doc in the back here about this, who's a pediatrician, and he was like, you know, especially in the old days, man, when they call you, you, you just want to drop everything to take that call. Because number one, the patient is waiting. Number two, they might have found something that could be very clinically important. And number three, they're the last voice that the patient hears. So if you're developing a relationship with a patient, a therapeutic alliance with a patient, you don't want someone due to miscommunication to sabotage that relationship by saying something that isn't concordant with what you've been saying. So communication between clinicians and pharmacists is absolutely vital. When I used to get called, I would do discharge medications, the pharmacy would call me and be like, did you really want to give this guy you know, 40 milligrams of lisinopril when he's on you know, all this Lasix? Because typically we might worry about the kidneys. And I go, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought it up. I'm glad you're looking at this. But the thing with this guy is he's actually Lasix resistant. His creatinine was here. And this is why we're doing it. So it's cool. And the pharmacist would say, all good. Just wanted to make sure. That is the kind of call that you appreciate. Because when they do catch that you screwed something up or you didn't think about something or you missed something, or you want them to tell them like, hey, you know what? And I forgot to tell the patient, could you say that the reason we're doing this is this? They will gladly do that. And that is the, that is the beauty of having another human being talking to the patient at the point that they're delivering the medication. And that's just one of the litany of things that pharmacists do. And over my career, I, I grew to appreciate and love pharmacy and pharmacists more than I, even many of my colleagues, just because I had such respect for what they did. And they understand the pharmacology, the pharmacokinetics. If I were having someone manage Coumadin for me, I wouldn't want a doc doing it. I would actually want a pharmacist using a robust protocol and having experience in the space to manage my anticoagulation, right? They do a very good job of it. And it's stuff like this. They ought to be thinking about helping to manage our chronic disease, giving immunizations, doing anticoagulation. And that's the outpatient world where 42% of uh, pharmacists practice in a community setting, right? Tom? Uh, Janet Carter says, a pharmacist should be the patient's best friend. They know way more than the docs about meds, actually. As a nurse, I can't imagine life on the job without a direct line to a pharmacist. Well, let, let's talk about this for a second. So there's a lot of tension a lot of times between nursing and pharmacy, right? Man, I sent that med request down for a long time ago and it's not back yet. And I think it's the same thing. It's like, well, there's a lot going on in an inpatient pharmacy. You're mixing up complicated chemo, you're mixing up TPN, you're advising doctors, you're on the phone. Our pharmacists at Stanford uh, in the inpatient side, man, they were intense. And when you get on the phone with them, prepare to get a lecture. There was this pharmacist, Larry. And you know, the residents used to be terrified of interactions with Larry. And the reason was, is Larry was a smart dude. So what would happen is you had these know-it-all Stanford internal medicine residents. And they'd be like, damn it, I gotta get a dose on, uh, on this particular regimen that I'm giving this patient in bed five. I gotta call the pharmacy, hopefully Larry's not working. <laughs> well, Larry's working and this is what would happen. Larry would be like, oh, hello, yeah. Now, you know what's real interesting because the recent data on dinctomycin is really contradictory. So they looked at patients just like yours. In New England Journal, 5-3, page 73, and he would dig into that ish. Yeah. And the residents would be like, oh, I got 30 patients, man, I don't need this right now. But the reason he did it is he knew his shit. I yeah. knew his stuff. And, and, and we would all, like literally, there was uh, tremendous respect for him, but people were scared because they knew it'd be a time suck. And that's the problem now with this world of health 2.0. We're so volume driven and so metrics driven that we sometimes forget that this is a beautiful, sacred enterprise where the interaction with other human beings is important, not just with our patients, but with fellow people on the team. And pharmacy is a key component of that. So if we all walked a mile in each other's shoes, 
if I could be a nurse for a week, a pharmacist for a week, a CNA for a week, the guy in Supply Central for a week, we might find that we do our job 4x more compassionately, better, and more efficiently by knowing what the other uh, people in, on the team are doing. Brian Weagle says, former pharmacy tech here, techs are the backbone of the pharmacy. We see the mistakes first before they make it to the pharmacist. Dude, you know who was the OG pharmacy tech? No. George Bailey. What? Who's George You don't remember Bailey? that scene in It's a Wonderful Life? <laughs> when he <laughs> saves the dude, he was going to put poison in the bottle, man. <laughs> and he didn't put poison in. He put the George Bailey, dude. <laughs> original pharmacy tech right there. <laughs> OT. Original tech. You know what's amazing, guys? So you got to understand. So Tom Heineber went to film school. And he's probably thinking, now I work with Z, like, what good's my film school? <laughs> he just pulled it out on the show live. And it almost made sense. Um, it made total sense. Yeah. It made total sense. <laughs> so, so anyway, so looking at the article the woman wrote in response to this, the pharmacist, she says, you know, there's like 230,000 people who go to the hospital each year because of medication-related problems. And I think this is uh, an Australian article. So there's a huge issue, and I can tell you, pharmacists, if they didn't exist, that number would be even bigger. Absolutely true. To drill down into the time it takes to reduce the role of pharmacists and the role they play in providing that vital check, in our healthcare system to ensure medication is safe for the individual and they know how to use it. So this is really, you know, if you really look into it, it takes time. Now, could we be more efficient? Sure. If we didn't have to do so much administrative crap, we could be pretty efficient. Unfortunately, our tech isn't there yet. Our health IT doesn't support us well enough. Now, just so you all know, um, I'm going to be speaking at the National Community Pharmacy Association in Orlando in October. And in advance of that, we're going to be putting out a couple videos and doing some stuff to really support and celebrate our pharmacists uh, around the country and around the world. And part of that message is let's actually leverage technology to make these things easier. How, how many times, and, and the doc back here and I were talking about this before, have you shown up to the pharmacy with a prescription in hand and Tom's like, okay, I got this hemorrhoidal butt cream mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's super, super spicy. Yeah. Like this is the good stuff. It's brand new, fresh off the press. I need it. I need it because need it. my butt burns. Mm -hmm. Like that at- Hot fire. Hot Fire. It's hotter than my mixtape, y'all. Yo. But it's hot. It's like a 90s mixtape that you sent to that first girl that you were just like, this is the one. It's hot. That's Volcanic. how hot it was. Mm -hmm. But you know what was also hot? The out-of-pocket expense you'd have to pay for that because it's not on formulary. Yeah, and burned. your burned. your insurance company just pulled the formulary and changed it without telling anyone. Now the pharmacist has to deliver that news to the patient front line in the big long line with Granny, Missy, Bobby, Jerome, and Jack. And now Billy's going, wait, what? My butt cream. Actually, Tommy Heinever. Yeah. My butt cream ain't covered and starts throwing a fit. That's true. Whose fault is it? The pharmacist? Hell no. It's the shoot the messenger thing, right? So people get this DMV feeling in the pharmacy. Now, here's the thing. One of the points is, what if you actually knew your pharmacist? Like, what if it was like Cheers and you walk into the pharmacy and you hear cling, cling, cling. You want to go where people know the butt cream ain't all the same. <laughs> You want to know where everybody's troubles and everybody knows your name. Ah, don't you want to get away? And that kind of place is your sort of community pharmacy where you do know the pharmacist and they've known you for years and they know that your butt is a particular type of butt that requires a particular type of butt cream. And they will work hard to preempt you spending a lot of time. You can call in advance, you can set it up so that you're not waiting that long. And that is one answer. The problem is those independent pharmacies are dying away. Why? For the same reason independent physician practices are dying away or independent um, uh, other kind of uh, sort of medical uh, things are dying away because it's hard to scale them. It's hard to be integrated with health IT because it's so expensive as, as a one-off. And things like insurance yeah. and the middlemen, the dreaded middlemen, the pharmacy benefit managers. Can I tell you a quick story? Yeah, yeah. My uncle's father uh, ran a independent pharmacy for many years in Amish country. Wow. And it, it's a, it was in Arthur, Illinois, and it was a centerpiece of that community. I mean, they sold ice creams and comic books and all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff. And it was like that people went to the pharmacy and they liked, you know, they liked hanging out there. And it was, yeah, so it's exactly what you're describing. You keep spending most our lives living in an Amish paradise. <laughs> I can't believe you've never told me that story before. No, it's true, yeah. It's amazing. Uh, so, well, th but this is the thing. And you can imagine in Amish country, you almost have to practice that way. Yeah. Because they're not going to trust, you know, no. Joe Blow from CVS. By the way, everybody in Amish country is strapped. 
Like literally, you try to jack an Amish person, you will get a bullet and you get a shotgun spray in your face. Yeah, because there's no electricity on a gun. You know? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Of course, it's a musket from 1783, but it's cool, man. Excuse me, sir. All right. Pop, pop, pop. Another brother drops. Um, what were we talking about? <laughs> pharmacies. Yeah. Pharmacy, pharmacy. So independent pharmacies, you know, they are, they're, they're, they're a dying breed because the pharmacy benefit managers do these things called uh, clawbacks and direct and indirect remuneration and other things that make it very hard to stay in business as a retail practice and as a pharmacist in general, right? So this whole pastiche makes it very hard to be a pharmacist. Now, one of the other things we were talking about, the good doc and I, were that nowadays this sort of level of um, critical thinking and service has, it seems in our experience, and we're a little older, to have eroded. It used to be the pharmacist would call us with stuff instead of just dispensing it. Now they're under so much pressure and their time is so devalued that they don't. They would rather just give a medication to the patient and say, well, that may cause hair to grow on your back, but you know, <laughs> your doctor must know what they're doing. And it's like, that's the last thing the patient needs to hear because again, it's gonna sabotage the therapeutic alliance. Much rather have the phone call and go, you realize that uh, posterior hirsutism is a consequence of giving this hormone injection or whatever it is, right? So it, the same thing has happened in nursing where we're valuing click boxes and treating the chart over making that phone call that isn't just algorithm based when your intuition is tingling and you're like, I don't think we ought to be doing this. And you're, you're concerned that the doc on the other end is so hairy they don't want to hear it because they're so busy. And, and, and this guys, if you're going to have Health 3.0, and I'm real excited because this week we're going to have Robbie Pearl, the CEO, former CEO of Kaiser, come on the show and talk about his book, Mistreated. And I've been reading that book. It is spot on in terms of what needs to happen, what's wrong with our system, what needs to happen to build Health 3.0. Whatever you call it, it is Health 3.0 that we're trying to build. All right, comments. Uh, Deborah says, love the small town pharmacy. Uh, Carrie says, here in the UK, when I order my RPT med script, it goes straight to the pharmacy across the road electronically. And my script for catheters and peristine goes straight to the company who deliver it, med retired RN. Okay, so think about this. Once again, health IT's role, we love to ridicule it here on the show. I did a song called EHR State of Mind, kind of ridiculing how bad our EHRs are. That's because the technology is like a 90s level car phone, right? Mm -hmm. Like, wow, we can make phone calls in the car. You know, it's a rotary dial, it has horrible reception. So we just need to make it better, but no one denies that being able to make a call from your car, assuming it's safe and has speakerphone, is dope AF. It's the same with health IT. When you tie together you know, Epic Systems and the pharmacy uh, EHR and the delivery you know, of the medical devices all in one system, it's integrated, everybody's skin's in the game, we have all the stuff at the tip of our fingers, we can see interactions, we can make stuff happen, and doctor shopping and other things that uh, happen with opioid abuse, less easy to do, all those things are good advances and we should embrace them and also rage against when it slows us down. Make the interface better. Give us support so that we can use the technology to its actual potential. And that's what hasn't happened yet. That's why we call it Health 2.0. They're trying, but they're effing it up. 3.0 will transcend that. We'll take technology and use it to leverage, including big data, like all the data that will then say, you know what? When you give that lisinopril with that Lasix in the setting of the vitamin C that he's taking, everything go boom. Dude, and we see, only know that because we have the data to show it. Let's speak on the pharmacist ultimate technology. The tube. So I'm a hospitalist, guys. So I know the inpatient pharmacy dearly. They round with us. They are tremendous contributors to the team. Many of them have done residencies above the four years of pharmacy training. Smart, smart, and engaging folks. Why the hell are we using pneumatic tubes in a hospital? Are you kidding me? And, and the thing is, it's like, it literally, at Stanford, it's just this hole in the wall, all right, where you walk up and it goes <laughs> None of it is like, we don't code in or anything. We just pick up a tube. Hey, whose tube is this? Oh, this is some, huh, oh, this looks like stool. Maybe that was supposed to go to the lab. Oh, it says rule out Ebola. Fantastic! <laughs> tube systems are insane. I mean, they work kind of, but you would think it's a 21st century, like what? Is this Hogwarts still? Are we magicians and wizards or are we doctors? Are we, are we not men? We are Devo. 
are we not men DBO? So again, the pneumatic, you know, bum, 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 going through the hospital. By the way, you can't, uh, Tom, you were saying that your wife was saying that you cannot ship narcotic, dispense narcotics through the tube system because it right. takes one check and balance away from the human delivering the narcotic. Yeah, I learned that today because the first, she was telling me about the tube system and the first thing I thought was, oh, I'm going to check that for narcotics. <laughs> now I'm there. <laughs> she was like, oh, Tom. there's no narcotics that go through the tube system. I was like, <laughs> Dang. Oh man, Tom's always on the on the make. <laughs> now you're gonna see him at like you know Summerlin Hospital, is sitting there at the thing like oh funk, tube, no narcs, damn it, funk. stool and urine, okay, funk. oh some kind of organ. Can I smoke that? No, that's amazing, dude. Uh, so again, I think the bottom line, folks, is pharmacy takes time because they have to do a lot of stuff. We can get more efficient with health IT. We should respect and love and support our fellow teammates no matter what they do in healthcare. And pharmacy is at the top of the list in my estimation of people who are undervalued uh, and should get our respect, admiration, and support. We should let them and force them to practice at the top of their license. We should fix the reimbursement system for uh, medications so that we're not forcing them to do so much clerical crap and be the bad guy and the messenger that everybody hates. And we as patients should be more patient with them, but at the same time, we should work on that delivery side to make the patient experience amazing because it actually can be. If we are supported, we're given the right tools, technologic and, and uh, more moral, moral wise, like if, if we actually have the morale and the support and the technology to do our jobs well, we will make the patient experience amazing. It's just a fact. We shouldn't be afraid of patient satisfaction. We should be afraid of gaming our crappy system to make those scores go up. We have to revamp the entire system, and we're gonna talk about that more this week, especially on Wednesday. What do you think, Tom Heinenberg? Have we done this or not? I think it's pretty much time to call the code on this one, Z. And uh, just a little word of warning for our people in Australia. Um, if you're in a confrontation with a kangaroo, hit it with crowbar. <laughs> a lot of people don't know this, but they're, al they're allergic to crowbar strikes. I hate you so much, Tom Heinenberg. <laughs> How can we dance when the kangaroo's burning? We're out. One, two, <laughs> How do we sleep when the kangaroo's hurling?